The original sermon title I submitted for the bulletin is not the one we're going to preach today. Stay tuned for that, bu- that sermon. It's a good one, I promise. It's just not what we're going to share today. Something hit me late in the week. That happens occasionally. And I thought it was the perfect message for the beginning of the year. Uh, because this is a lesson that I've been learning over the course of my ministry over the last 12 years. And I'm going to tell you a little story to lead into that and why I think this is so important. And it has to do specifically with pastors. But the lesson that I'm learning as a pastor, as, as I go through life, is something that's applicable to all of us. And it has something to do with purpose and position and how we often confuse the two. We often believe that our position and our possessions in life are the same as our purpose. What we are going to find out is if you confuse the two, you are leaving yourself vulnerable for your faith crumbling under your feet. And this is a lesson that pastors have got to learn in their ministry. And if they don't, God forbid, someday, if they can no longer be in ministry, their faith may leave with their position. Before we get too much further, though, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your love, your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. Thank you for Jesus who has called us all into a relationship with you and shown us who you are. Thank you, Lord, that we know you through the face of Jesus, and it's our desire to see him. And the only way that we see him today is if your Holy Spirit is here with us. We plead for your Holy Spirit. We plead that you would open our minds, our hearts, and our ears so that we may see the face of Jesus, hear his voice, and understand his heart. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. There was a pastor that I knew back in New York who had dedicated his life to the church. He had been in ministry for almost 50 years, and he retired, and soon after he retired, a tragedy struck his life. He had a massive stroke, and he survived the stroke, but as is often the case with stroke victims, uh, their verbal skills often lag. Sometimes they never come back completely. And what he found is that he could speak and communicate just fine, but if he would stand in the pulpit to preach, the thoughts in his head would not connect with what his tongue was doing and saying. Some of you are familiar with how this works sometimes. Maybe you suffered a stroke or someone that you love has suffered a stroke. You just can't communicate like you would want to communicate. You can't make the words come out the way that you would want those words to come out. And because of this, he very quickly descended into a depression. You see, as pastors, we begin to believe that our calling and our position is our identity and our purpose in life. It's very easy to do because you dedicate 24-7 of your life to ministering and to thinking of that next sermon and what's the next book I'm going to read to give me just a little bit more and how can I be a good minister at home and in the church it becomes all of who you are becomes every piece of your life something hit me that the time when I saw my one of my mentors in ministry suffer what he was suffering and God began to ask me a question that he's, beginning, that he's continued to answer for me over the years. And the question went like this. If you could no longer be a preacher, would you still be a Christian? So in other words, all of the ways that you define yourselves, find your identity, and find your purpose in life, if that was taken away from you, would you still believe? Now, many of you look at the preacher and say, of course you'd still believe. You're this strong man of faith. But I want to submit to you today that the answer to that question isn't as easy as most of you might be thinking. Think of every way that you understand yourself. If I asked you who you were here today, you would say something like, well, I'm the mother of four, I'm the mother of three. And here's my education, here's my career, and here's where we're from, and these are all my customs and all my traditions. 
If all of those things suddenly crumbled away from you and fell away, how would it affect your life and your faith? It's easy to answer, well, I would strongly maintain my faith through it all. The issue, though, is, as I've been to many of your homes, maybe you, maybe not your home, but the home of your, your brothers and sisters here in the church or throughout the, the Christian community, friend, family members and friends who have gone through something similar and their faith is struggling. And one of the greatest reasons that pastors struggle in that situation and people struggle in that situation is because we have confused our position and our possessions with our life's purpose. You were born and made for something different than the position that you've been placed in at this moment. Your calling is different from your life's purpose. This is something that's foreign to us as Christians. Because we often look at it and we read verses like, uh, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and or I ordained you a prophet to the nation. So therefore, Jeremiah, I believe it is, was born to be a preacher. And unless he becomes a preacher, he's not fulfilling his cause and fulfilling his purpose. But I want to ask you the question this morning. Is every preacher called? Yes or no? Are, are all preachers called? Are pastors called? I believe that. But are all pastors successful? What's the ratio of successful prophets in Scripture? <laughs> it's not very good, is it? Most of them were killed by the people they were sent to. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, even the life... Don't get me wrong, don't, don't, don't think pastor's gone off the deep end on this one, but even the ministry of Jesus, they killed him. Daniel, was Daniel successful? Did he save the kings he was sent to? Here's the thing. If your calling and your position are your purpose, that means some people have been born to be failures. How does that sit with you? Now, none of you, for, for, for a lot of us it's okay because you never think you're the one that's called to be a failure, but think about that pastor who's called to that church in small town wherever, who they're struggling with this issue and they're struggling with that issue. Can I tell you a true story? Can I tell you a true story? You know how sometimes we as Adventists believe there's a ghost hiding behind every corner? We, we turn into fear, fearful people sometimes. There was a church that was so fearful of things that the pastor began to put Bible verses up on the screen. And they said, Pastor, that's some of that new methodology that we're hearing about. They voted as a board to not use a PowerPoint projector in church. I am not making that up. So this pastor is supposed to go into this church and be successful. And often because we equate our purpose with our position, if I'm not successful in my position, what does that say about my life's purpose? Is it possible that the reason you are alive and the position that you've been given or placed in are two different things? I want to show you this. Go with me to the book of Job. Because Satan tempts Job and he reveals something about what he believes about us in the temptation of Job. So go to Job chapter 1. And when you get there, say amen. Job chapter 1 and verse 8. Job chapter 1, verse 8, when you're there, say amen. amen. This is what Satan believes about how we identify and know God. Look what he says. Job 1, this by the way, this is Lucifer going in as representative of earth in front of the Father. They're arguing and debating, or, or he's arguing and debating about the, 
the role and value of man, how man sees God, what's happening on planet Earth. And look at what Lucifer says about Job. Uh, verse 8, and this, the, the, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on all the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Are you with me? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. You see what Lucifer believes about man? Lucifer believes that we relate God to the success of our lives. So in other words, we believe we see the face of God in our successes, our position, and our possessions. You following that, yes or no? So what he's saying is, God, if you let me remove all of that stuff, Job won't even know who you are. Let me take all that away, because that's how Job sees your face. That's, he equates you with all of that stuff. The question is, is this true about Job? In many ways, the answer to that question is yes. Because at one point, Job says to God, why have you hidden your face from me? You know the story of Job. His family's taken away, his position's taken away, his money's taken away, his friends begin to turn their back on him, he sit, his health is taken away, and he's sitting there in sackcloth and ashes, and he's wondering, God, why have you hidden your face from me? And you see what Job has done? He's equated the face of God with his success, his possessions, and his position. When they're taken away, he says, God, where are you? The question is, had God really left Job, yes or no? God had never left Job. But Job thinks God has left because the success of his life and his possessions and his family are gone. In fact, I love the, I love the, the, the last third of the book of Job because it's all of those passages about God saying things like, Job, where... I love how God's, gird up your loins, Job, because I'm about to address you. And what God spends several chapters doing is saying, Job, you think that all of me is found in your job and your money and your career and your family and your successes? You think that that sums me up? You have thought of me way too small. And so God begins to describe himself to Job, and he says, Job, can you feed the hungry lion? I love the passage where he says, have you seen the storehouses in heaven with all of the hail and all of the snow? He said, do you tell the lightning bolt where to strike? He says things like, were you there when I created all of this and all the morning stars sang my glory or sang for glory? I love that passage. What would that have been like? He says, Job, did you tell the ocean how far to go and no further? This is not just God boasting. This is God saying to Job, Job, you've sold me short. I am so much more than your position and your possessions. I am so much more than just the things that I've given you. Now, can we see God in the things that he's given us and the positions that he's given us? Sure we can. But if we believe that we identify and know God primarily through those things, if you believe your purpose and your position are the same thing, you no longer have faith in God. You have faith in the place in your position. What happens if you no longer have a job? Is your faith bigger than your blessings? So after God reminds Job of all that he is, he says, Job, it's not that I've left you, it's all the ways that you thought you knew me have gone, but I've not changed. I've been here all along. I have not decreased my, my your, value, your value in my eyes has not decreased. You are to me what you've always been to me. 
Look what Job says in Job chapter 42. So everything has been removed from Job. He has nothing left. His position, his wealth, his family, he's got nothing left. Job chapter 42 and verse 5. Listen to what Job says after God reminds Job of all that he is. Job 42, verse 5. If you're there, say hallelujah. hallelujah. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Look what Job says. But now, now, now my eye sees you. Here's the amazing thing. God did not let Job go while everything was being taken away from him. But God knew that even Job wouldn't lose his faith. Job knew who God was in some way. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, Job says. But God knew that by a lot... <laughs> Satan thought he was going to rob Job from God's hands. God knows that Job's going to remain faithful somehow. Satan removes all the things, all the possessions, his position and his possession from Job, and no, Job now sees God in a way he's never seen him before. He sees him as he is now. Because it's the human thing, it's the temptation, it's what Lucifer uses. He allows us to think that what we have and where we are and our calling is life is who we are and what our life's purpose is. So when it all crumbles around us, I've lost value in God's eyes. I don't know who I am anymore. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, what if your position and your purpose are two different things? He says, now my eyes see you. I want to ask you a question. What's your purpose in life? Why are you alive? Why has God put breath in your lungs and why is your heart beating in your chest? It's not for your education. Your purpose is not your education. Your purpose is not your career. Your purpose is not even your calling. You have one purpose in this life. And that's to know and be with God. And the sooner every single minister, that's you included, you and me, the sooner we, we grow to understand that, the better off we will all be and the more we will know ourselves and be content in this life. Because if my purpose is different than my position, I can fail in my position and still feel fulfilled in my purpose. It doesn't matter what the results of my job are. It doesn't matter how much money I have in the bank. I can still feel fulfilled in my purpose in life if my purpose is to know and be with God. That's why you're alive. You know, and it's, it's really an interesting thing. We've been fed that from the time we're small, but it's a little bit of an, let me say this gently, westernized small view of the world. And let me tell you why that is. What it, we live in the land of opportunity, don't we? We live in a very blessed place in this world. But what about people that don't? It's easy to say for people that have all these wonderful opportunities and all these uh, 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 opportunities to succeed and fulfill their purpose through career and education and, and, and achievement. But what about people that don't have those opportunities? Are you telling it's me it's my life's purpose to fail and be in poverty? Are you telling me that it's my life's purpose to not even know where my next meal is that I'm going to feed my children? That's my life's purpose? Because if my position and my purpose, that's my position, that's some people's position in this world. Of course it's not your purpose in life. Your position and your purpose are two different things. Your purpose is to know God. And praise the Lord that He can use our position, He uses our position and uses our calling in this world to show us the glory of our true purpose. Because when you're hungry, you've only got one place to turn. 
when you need something, there's only one place to turn. It doesn't matter how blessed you are or how few opportunities you are if you understand that your sole purpose in this world is to know and be with God, then you can be fulfilled and find who God truly wants you to be no matter what the conditions of your life. You know, how do we know this is true? Well, if we look at the eyes of Jesus, if we look at the life of Jesus, if we look at the ministry of Jesus, we know that all God ever wanted for man, we see in, in, in the person of Jesus Christ. We talked about that last week. We talked about how much the incarnation of Jesus means to us. And in Jesus, what we see is God so completely rolled up with man that it's inseparable. He's fully God and He's fully man. Amen? Are you with me? And in the person of Jesus Christ, God and man are so completely connected that they cannot be separated. That's what God wanted for us. We see it in the creation week. You know about this. Uh, we've talked about this before, but uh, each of the six days of creation have a companion. One day he makes a space, another day he fills that space with life. One day he makes light, another day he makes the heavenly bodies that give off light. One day he makes land, another day he puts animals to fill the land. You following that? Day one goes with day four, day two goes with day five, day three goes with day six. And we see the purpose for the entire creation week. Everything that God did in those six days, we see it all embodied, or we see it all fulfilled in the seventh day. The seventh day has been set aside and sanctified so that we may know what every cell and organism from the smallest to the largest are here for. And what was the seventh day for? To be with God. Everything God did on those other six days were for that purpose. Relationships between people to know God and be with God. That's their primary purpose. Animals and life, all the laws of science, everything God did on those other six days were for one purpose, so that we may know and be with God. We were made on the sixth day. We were made to be with God. Jesus was the promise all along, amen? He is Emmanuel, God with us. In Him we see the purpose for man. We see all God has ever wanted was to be with us. That is why you are alive. You, I don't live to be a minister. I live to be with Jesus. And as soon as I start thinking that being a minister is my life's purpose, I can no longer be a minister. You want to be a good minister? Be with Jesus. You want to be a good mother? Be with Jesus. You want to be a good father? Be with Jesus. You want to be a good single person and dedicate and, and purify your life? Be with Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's what life is about. So even if I fail in my ministry, I can still fulfill God's purpose for my life by being with Him. And I want to say something to you in a very specific portion of our congregation. I hope what I say doesn't embarrass anybody, but I, I think most of us know that people are struggling with this in our, in our congregation. So I just want to speak plainly to some of you. You ready? And say, know that I say this in complete love and sincerity. You know the, the desire of my heart for all of you. Amen? Amen? There are people in our congregation, particularly those that are in the immigrant population of our church, when you were back home, you had a certain level of respect. You had a certain level of education, and you had a certain level of, of career. Society looked at you one way, and then you came here to the United States, and society began to look at you a different way. They didn't respect your education, and they didn't respect your status, and they, didn't, they said, well, you, what you were over there isn't quite what you're going to be here. 
and you felt like you've had to start over. I want to encourage you today. Whatever position you might be in today, your value in God's eyes has never changed. Your value in the eyes of your family has never changed. Your value to your church and in the service of God has never, ever changed. We love you and we respect you. God loves you and God has infinite value on your life. So no matter where you find yourself today, whether it's in, because you're an immigrant man who's come here and you've had to start all over with your family, or because you've lost your job, or simply because you came here with no hope because you think all hope is gone because of your situation, I want to remind you today, today, that in God's eyes, you are just as valuable as you ever have been. Nothing is lost in His eyes and in His heart for you. If you have to start over, start over with confidence that your current position and your life's purpose are two different things. Now we understand why Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all things will be added unto you. Because God wants you to be at peace and at home and He wants you to feel secure and safe and, and like you have value and purpose. He never wants us to define ourselves, find our identity in our position and in our possessions. Because He knows that this world is crumbling with selfishness and sin and He knows 2016 is going to be a horrible year for some of you. Thanks a lot, Pastor Hall. <laughs> We're supposed to come and hear New Year's resolutions and how to set goals and all these things, you know, on the first Sabbath in January, but I just want to level with you. For some of you, 2016 is going to be rough. But if you make it your life's purpose in 2016 to set your eyes on knowing God with all of your heart, no matter what your circumstances are, you can have the happiest year of your life. Before we close, I want to just bring up some very grave dangers in believing that your purpose and your position are the same thing. And the first thing is something that I mentioned already. If you believe your calling and your purpose, your purpose and your position are the same thing, that means God has made some people for their life's purpose to be a failure. I don't believe God does that. If your purpose and your position are two different things, then the success you have in life or in your position has nothing to do with your life's purpose and shows nothing compared to God, the value that God has for you in His heart. In fact, if we think of it properly, in that context, your failures can be used as a vehicle to drive us back to knowing our true purpose. That's really what a calling is, by the way. A calling isn't your life's purpose. A calling is a way that God has reached out to your specific heart, the way He, he designed you personally and individually. He knows how to reach your heart. And isn't it interesting, people that are truly feeling like they're fulfilling their life's calling, do you hear what they say? They don't say, Boy, I'm glad I worship the God of music. They say something like, by performing music, it draws me closer to God. Do you see the difference there? But if you make music your God, if your voice goes, or you can't play the piano anymore, so does your faith. If I make preaching my God and being a minister my God, if I can't preach anymore, or I can't write anymore, or I can't minister anymore, my God has died. God uses our calling to draw us to our true purpose. And our true purpose is to know and be with Him. I love this. I came up with this today. Sometimes you come up with a nice saying and you're pretty happy that you did. All God wants is you. 
He doesn't need your resume. Somebody say amen to that. All he wants is you. He doesn't need your resume. Because some of our resumes are embarrassing. Whether it's the resume of your spiritual life and your sin, or whether it's the resume of your successes. Some of us don't have any, and you're like, what am I supposed to do in this life? And the Lord's like, well, I'll show you, but get to know me. He doesn't need your resume. If you believe that your position and your purpose are the same thing, you will no longer be trusting in God, but you will only have faith in your position. I want to say this and and just be very clear, and this specifically goes to to me as a pastor, but it can be applied, applied to all of us. If your position and your calling and your purpose are the same thing, if you believe that your position and your purpose are the same thing, you can no longer be a minister. Because you don't become a minister by being attached to your position. You become a minister by being attached to Jesus. You want to be a good minister? Go be with Jesus. What's a calling? Your calling gives you a reason to know your purpose. It's a vehicle through which God shows you your true purpose, and that's to be with God. But it itself is not your reason for living. Your occupation is not your reason for being alive. Your talents and gifts are not your reason for being alive. Your family, though it's a blessing and a wonderful gift from God, it's not your primary reason for being alive. Your primary reason for being alive is to know God and be with Him. If you're expecting this world to give you a handout and all of a sudden everything's going to be really great, we've got another thing coming. I don't know what 2016 holds for you. I don't know what it holds for me. But I want to make an appeal to you today. Will this year be the year that you finally understand and fulfill your life's purpose? You thought it was you know, I'm going to get my education and I'm going to get my life on track and I'm going to take this step and this step and this step and I'm finally going to get in shape. But the problem is you do that every year and you join a gym and in the second week of January you just drop out. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do this and through all this I'm going to understand who I am and what God's purpose is for my life. All of those things are wonderful. Goal setting is a good thing and don't ever think that pastor's up here thinking, you know, pastor said that you know, education isn't my life's purpose, mom and dad, so I'm dropping out of school. <laughs> Not what we're saying. All of those things can be tools to understand your life's purpose, but the point of all of this is If you really want to be fulfilled in 2016, if you really want to understand why you are alive, if you want to understand how to spread your wings and truly fly, it's not going to come by meeting the right person and getting married. It's not going to come by losing 20 pounds. It's not going to come by making this change or setting that goal. It's only going to come by setting your heart and your mind to seek God with all of your heart. Because when you seek Him, you find Him. And when you find Him, you truly understand what life is for. And life is for knowing and being with God. Will 2016 finally be the year where you discover your life's purpose? I don't know what blessings or problems are coming this year for you. But I guarantee you, if you set your heart to know Jesus 
and spend time with Him. No matter what your circumstances are, you will have the happiest and most fulfilling year of your life. You are alive to know Jesus. Will you purpose in your heart to do nothing but seeking God with all that you have? Will this finally be the year where you get it all figured out? If you'd like to make that special commitment, would you stand wherever you are as we sing our closing song? And, and we... Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for showing us that this year might be the year where we find true joy in the Lord. Nothing in this world can give us the true satisfaction and joy of our heart. Nothing can fill that God-shaped hole but you. And so, Lord, no matter what happens, if we are seeking you with all of our hearts, no matter what the successes or failures, our faith will never crumble. Because we know that we don't see your face in our blessings. It's just a vehicle that you use to point us to your face. Because all you've ever wanted is to be with us. So, Lord, may this year finally be the year where we understand our life's purpose. It's not about career success. It's not about money in the bank. It's not about finally achieving this goal or that goal. It's about life. And life is about knowing you. May that be our one and only goal as we move forward. Knowing that we have been created to know you and be with you. And no better way to know you than by looking into the face of Jesus. Thank you for this wonderful gift. Thank you. And may this become clearer to us every day. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.